All righty. Well, good evening, everybody. For those of you who are joining us for your very first time tonight, my name is Zach Judd. I'm the director of education at Florida Oceanographic Society, and I'm really excited to welcome all of you to tonight's installment of the 2023 Florida Oceanographic Coastal Lecture Series. Uh, out of curiosity, do I have any first time attendees in the house tonight? Oh, cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming out. You're kind of catching us towards the end of our series, but I do want to let you know that all of our previous lectures are recorded and posted on our website. So if you go back and look at uh, our list of topics, you might find that there were some cool presentations that we've held over the last few months that you might want to revisit and watch from the comfort of your own home. Tonight's guest speaker, Jeff Beal, is the Florida Regional Biologist for Ducks Unlimited. Jeff holds a bachelor's degree from Jacksonville University and a master's degree from Florida Institute of Technology. He spent the last 30 years studying various aspects of marine and estuarine habitats in Florida with organizations like Ducks Unlimited, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, and Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. Much of Jeff's efforts have focused on coastal wetlands, but he's also worked on floodplains, seagrass meadows, shellfish beds, and coral reefs. Jeff is heavily involved in restoration projects that are designed to improve habitat and water quality for fish and wildlife. That's a big deal for all of us. Tonight, he's going to be telling us about some efforts that are underway to help protect and conserve Florida's wetlands. I'm really excited to welcome to the stage Jeff Beal. Thanks so much, Zach, and thanks everyone for joining us. Every time I hear that, uh, I, it makes me sound like I can't keep a job. Um, but I did work for uh, about 27 years with the state of Florida with the two different agencies, but uh, just a couple years ago, moved over to Ducks Unlimited. And I always like to start these talks by asking a basic question, how many of you have heard of Ducks Unlimited? Okay, good, most of you. Um, a few uh, unconverted there. so. Uh, I'll definitely uh, take a few minutes if I can, or a bit of a commercial to tell you about uh, the mission of DU. It was created in 1937 as a nonprofit advocate for waterfowl populations. And you think about the history of our country, that was coming out of the Great Depression. It was the Dust Bowl era. And uh, the leaders of DU had, uh, the founders of DU that is, had just a tremendous forethought about the importance of wetlands, their role in uh, soils, keeping soil on the landscape, uh, keeping our farmlands uh, in good working order and so forth. But uh, specifically, their concern was about waterfowl populations. And they've become a world leader in uh, wetland conservation. And when I say conservation, I mean both the acquisition uh, and restoration of these important habitats. They have their own land trust, uh, Wetland America Trust. It's one of the largest in the country with over 500 properties, the largest of which is in the state of Florida. More on that later. And there you see the mission statement for us, to conserve and restore wetlands and associated habitats for the benefit of waterfowl, other wildlife and people. We're made up of a team of biologists like myself, but also surveyors, engineers, fundraising arm, and a research arm with uh, over a million volunteers worldwide. It's a tremendous organization. I'm very, very pleased to be able to work with them. And as you consider the strategy across North America for DU, uh, what you'll notice is that there are certain wetlands that are of higher priority than others. The uh, Canadian and what we call the prairie pothole region of the central northern United States there, obviously are our highest priorities. But look at Florida. There's some priorities there as well, especially within the central Florida and within the panhandle. So even the area that we are sitting in tonight is an important priority for many reasons for waterfowl. Why is that, you might ask? The, tr the real story of snowbirds is the story here. So as you can see, a lot of these birds are coming to Florida, the predominantly from our prairie pothole region there in, in, in Canada and the north central United States. And we know this because we banned these birds and so we can track their, their migration. And I keep using this word prairie pothole. That's what this looks like uh, from the air. If you've ever spent any time in the, the Midwest or uh, the, the north central part of the US, it looks like this. This was formed by, by glaciation. So about 11,000 years ago is when the, what we call the Wisconsin glaciation started melting. And it left us with this. Um, so it's just a tremendous area for, for bottle. And a lot of this is being converted, unfortunately, in, into farmland, and we lose the wetlands at that as a result. And so we're working closely with uh, many of our private landowners and, and farmers and so forth to try to maintain these wetlands as best we can. 
because they are the duck factory, right? And as I mentioned, the founders of DU had incredible forethought, and they mostly worked within that landscape initially, what we call the duck factory. So here's just one of many wetlands they worked on many years ago. And the DU mission is accomplished by three corporations. There's DU Incorporated that I work for uh, within the, the continental US and, and Alaska and Hawaii as well. And then there's DU Canada and there's uh, DU Mexico. And as a result, across North America, we're able to, to work cooperatively on these issues. A lot of people ask, well, where does the money go if you're a nonprofit? We're a very lean operation. You know, most of our money is going directly into conservation, as you'll see on the, on the left there, 82%. And then here's just a breakdown of what we rely on in terms of uh, our financial support. A lot of it's through membership and events that our members are putting on. You perhaps have been to a DU banquet yourself. Uh, but we also get uh, quite a bit from grants, including federal grants. More on that later. And we recently celebrated uh, 15 million acres conserved in North America, which is just a tremendous amount. What does that mean for Florida? Well, here are the numbers there as of a couple years ago. Roughly 61,000 acres, over $15 million on projects, and we have about 17,000 members in Florida. And as you can see, you'll, there are certain counties where at this point we focus most of our attention, especially that central Florida region, which is very important, the headwaters of the Everglades. It's hard to wrap your mind around 15 million acres. What does that, what does that look like? Uh, well, imagine if we were to conserve part of Florida, that would be roughly one third of Florida. And as you look at the history of wetlands, it's interesting to note that even as much as about 40 years ago, wetlands were considered wastelands. They were considered habitats that were not important in any way. Uh, in fact, I'm sure you've heard of, of malaria. Uh, that comes from the Latin and the French, meaning bad air, because they thought that you got the malaria uh, disease, if you will, uh, from the smells of the marsh. And certainly, saltwater marshes have a smell to them, that rot rotten egg smell, which is hydrogen sulfide, a natural part of the system that's happening there, the breakdown of nutrients and so forth. Um, but that's what they believed at the time. And for that, re that reason, most uh, wetlands, uh, they, they just wanted to do away with them, convert them into usable land. And this is a, a real map. This map was from 1919, and the title of it is Wetlands in Need of Drainage. And <laughs> Every dot on the map represents 10,000 acres. So as you can imagine, you see Florida, Florida, of course, being a very wet place, second only to uh, Alaska in terms of land area that's wetland. There have been three attempts, by the way, to drain the Everglades. It's just unthinkable to, to me that they thought they could do it. Um, so three attempts in the last century to do it. Thank goodness they weren't successful. And as we look at how Florida squares with the, the rest of the country, we're looking at about 50% wetland loss. Pretty bad, but not as bad as other places, including the Midwest. So we're going to start with some terminology that will help us uh, through this talk, um, set the stage for uh, what we're going to do, looking at, looking at in terms of uh, Florida wetlands. So the few terms there, first is that of hydro period. Hydro meaning water, period meaning a period of time. So basically, wetlands have water on them at some, for some period of time. It could be all the year, it could be only part of the year, but that's an important aspect. And sometimes we refer to that as water table. Secondly, wetlands have specific soil types to them. As you see on the upper right there, if we took a core of a wetland, you'd have a horizon of various things within that. And that, stands, uh, that stays true for, for, for all wetlands to some degree. You have the leaf litter, so you have plants that are producing litter, uh, also called detritus. You have a, the peat formation, the muck formation. Muck, by definition, is 10% organic, and the rest is very fine fractions of uh, salt, silt and clay. Then you have uh, mineral soils underneath that. Uh, so as we're looking to define what wetlands are, soils is an important part of that. Oops, sorry. Uh, the plant community is, is, is the other one. Uh, wetland plants are very specific in their life history, what they can accommodate, and we use two terms there. Facultative, meaning you're on the fringe of the wetland, you don't have to be wet all the time, whereas obligate plants are ones that, that really need to be wet all the time. 
And then there's another term that we use in the wetland world called delineation. So if you and I were to go out with this uh, field, group of field biologists and try to delineate, that is determine the footprint of a given wetland, we would use a lot of these factors. Um, so that's the, the term that we use when we're trying to understand the footprint. And this, this wetland doesn't end until you get to the tree line way off in the distance. Very large wetland here in central Florida. Another term you see uh, with respect to wetlands is that of mitigation. And that is if, if wetlands are damaged, we, by law, we mitigate for them, right? We do something to replace their value. And for some time, uh, that would mean that we replace foot, the footprint. In other words, if we damage one acre, we, we have to, re to, re to create another acre. But there's been um, you know, a long debate, especially within the federal um, government, of the rules associated with this. And the term that often has been used is no net loss of wetlands. In other words, you could damage a wetland, and all you had to do was uh, restore the function of an existing wetland. So that might be to repair its hydrology or take out the exotic species that shouldn't be there in some, some way improve it. And so this is a long-running debate that, that's gone on you know, and continues to go on within our country. Uh, <clears throat> there are different wetland types. More on that in a moment. We're going to use the nomenclature of the Florida Natural Areas Inventory, or FNA, to look at those. Then a few more terms for us to, to look at. Palestrine refers to freshwater. Estuarine would be the mix of fresh and salt, like the Indian River Lagoon is an estuary, for example. Lacustrine refers to wetlands that are along lakes. Riverine, wetlands along rivers. The plant species, uh, some of them are gonna be woody, as in tree-like, and others are gonna be herbaceous, in other words, more like grasses and sedges. And then we have terms like emergent, so these are plants that are emerging out of the water. And then submergent forms, these are ones that are under the water. And then lastly, uh, one more term, and that is jurisdictional. We refer to delineating wetlands. Uh, we use the term jurisdictional with respect to the law. It's state law and federal law. And very quickly, I'm not going to bore you because we could spend a whole talk on this and it would be, we'd all be asleep by the end of it. Uh, <clears throat> But this is an example of what the Corps of Engineers from the federal side of the wetland uh, aspect, this is what they um, consider. So you have coastal tidal wetlands on the left-hand side, so an estuarine situation, and then freshwater on the right-hand side. And it just shows you the important aspects of it, especially what I'd like to focus your attention on there is what we call the intertidal area in an estuarine system or the littoral area in a freshwater system. This is where, this is sort of the business end of the wetland, right? This is where you have the plants that are emerging from the water or submerged. This is where a lot of the species, especially nursery habitat species, fishes, crabs, shrimps, etc., are going to spend the bulk of their time where wading birds will spend their time doing their foraging and so forth. So let's take a quick tour around the state using the FNA wetland types. So here's a seepage slope, and in that picture you'll see there's some um, carnivorous plants, hooded pitcher plants, very interesting. They will trap insects, much like a Venus flytrap, and use the nutrients of that insect. Here's a wet prairie, a marl prairie, that'll be uh, down in the Everglades um, with an underlayment of uh, limestone. Here's a shrub bog, more of those pitcher plants and other uh, rare plant species, especially flowers. Here's a depression marsh. Um, probably the most abundant wetland we're going to see in Florida is the, the depression marsh. A basin marsh, an example of that would be Okefenokee Swamp on the Florida-Georgia border. Here's an interdunal swale, so between the dunes uh, near the beach, uh, you can have a wetland that forms. Floodplain marsh as part of a river, this is the Mayaka. Here's a slough or slough marsh. And lastly, a glades marsh, the Everglades, of course, being the most famous example. So those were our non-forested, right? Those were our herbaceous wetlands. Now we're gonna move on to our forested ones, so they're gonna have a lot of woody species. Here's a dome swamp of cypress, a strand swamp, a floodplain swamp associated with a river, Basin swamp, again, much larger. A bay gall, so made up of all different types of bay trees, loblollies, magnolias, etc. 
hydrocamic, a lot of uh, palm trees as well as oaks, a bottomland forest, and an alluvial forest. And some of those might have looked pretty similar, right? Um, there's often times where biologists will debate, you know, how to exactly classify some of these places. Um, but it's the particular plant species that are in them that help us distinguish these. As we get to the salty side of things, marine estuarine, vegetated habitats, here's a salt marsh, mostly uh, North Florida on both coasts. Here's a mangrove swamp down in the Everglades. In the Florida Keys, a very rare habitat known as rock barren. So it's, it's a sort of a stunted mangrove community um, that's right on top of the ancient coral limestone. And then lastly, I put an asterisk there because this is not one of the ethnic communities, but I think it should be. And that's what we have here on this coast, uh, East Central Florida, known as mangrove marsh. You can see mangroves in there, uh, but you can also see some of the herbaceous forms, salt warts and glass warts and so forth. And at times, uh, especially with the uh, federal grant system, other habitats like seagrasses and oysters are considered wetlands. So why are they important? Well, they provide what we refer to as ecosystem services. So these are all the benefits to society uh, that wetlands provide. And it's quite a few. So let's look at a few. Recreation, how many of you enjoy canoeing, fishing, bird watching? Sure, wetlands are terrific for that. Drinking water, how many of you enjoy drinking water? <laughs> I brought some with me tonight just in case I need it. Yeah, very important in providing drinking water for us. Uh, fish and fisheries, blue crabs, shrimps, all the fishes that we like. Other, other food, including geese and waterfowl, and lots of other birds as well that, uh, that are important that uh, we don't consume. Here's one maybe you don't think about much, and that's pollinators, the insect community. Uh, there are 200 million insects for every person on the planet. Uh, they, they truly rule the planet in that sense. And Wetlands are very important in providing the pollinators, especially important for our farmers. Uh, farmers will hire beehives, beehive companies now, uh, to come to their farm in order to pollinate. Uh, so having natural community of this uh, within, within North America is very important. Coastal erosion. This is a picture of marshes being recreated by Ducks Unlimited and other partners in Louisiana, where they estimate that they lose a football field of marsh every day. So trying to reestablish the resiliency of the coast to reduce coastal erosion. And of course, imperiled species, things like wood stork and, and many others. Uh, in the panhandle of Florida, there are some rare salamanders that depend on wetlands. And so we consider their importance, it's as if uh, it's a puzzle and it's providing all these ecosystem services without one of those pieces that tends to break down and fall apart. They replenish groundwater, they do nutrient cycling, they sequester nutrients and contaminants. Uh, and you've probably heard some about carbon sequestration, the blue carbon market. Corporations are even involved in creating or, or conserving wetlands uh, for this issue of carbon. So when we look at something like flood intensity, that's, that's intricately linked uh, to wetland loss. So here's a natural situation, and we can see the runoff curve where the wetlands are storing water from a storm, say a hurricane, and slowly releasing that through the watershed uh, to a river. But if we change that, if we add ditching, where we're connecting the wetlands to those waterways, then see the curve changes much greatly, greatly. You have this major pulse at the beginning where you're losing soil and you're pushing contaminants into your waterways. And you're all well aware of the algal blooms in Florida, including right here in our own neighborhood. And this is the situation that uh, I think uh, is very true for Florida. This is very much a description of Florida. Everything's ditched. And there's lots of press on this, uh, the value of those wetlands. Um, here's one about Hurricane Sandy, $625 million of prevention because of those wetlands. And here was a study in 2008 that shows you the value of those wetlands uh, just in terms of storm protection. You can see Florida, some of the most important. 
Wetland area also equals water quality, and there's lots in the, in the literature about this. So, and this is nitrogen and specific, specifically nitrate, and um, how each of those, depending on the wetland footprint within a given watershed, uh, affects the, the amount of nitrate coming off that land. And it's that percent area of wetlands. So notice if you have 30% area of, of wetlands within a given watershed, your nitrate levels are low. So they're incredibly important at doing this. So here's a, some study that we did in Miss, Mississippi Alluvial, Alluvial Valley with all the work that DU has done there. And we're able to you know, put uh, a monetary value to, to many of these ecosystem services. Wetlands are five times more efficient than the best land-based nitrogen mitigation strategies. So we look at farming. Of course, farming is important, taking up nitrogen. Uh, but nothing does better than a wetland when it comes to this. Florida has a very strange wetland legacy. Uh, at statehood, we had about 20 million acres. We're down to about 11 million, uh, which is still 31% of the state, second only to Alaska. Lots of lakes. Uh, 90% of these wetlands are fresh water. Um, but probably the most interesting thing to me is ownership is roughly 50-50, public and private. So you can see the importance of us working with private landowners on these, on these wetlands. And that's something that uh, DU does. It's a very strong part of our mission. Most of Florida water, Florida's water, of course, is underground in aquifers. And we look at uh, Florida's coastal history, or maybe better described as hysteria, um, we, Here's a sh an aerial shot of Grant, Florida, just up the road from us. And we might think to ourselves, okay, this doesn't look too bad. I mean, I see mostly green. I don't see a lot of houses. Um, this doesn't look too bad. But as we zoom in, we discover some pretty telling issues. Here's Pelican Island National Wildlife Refuge, our first refuge. Um, it's, we've lost about 50% of it at this point. It's eroding away. Here's a major stormwater drain that's coming out of the neighborhood directly into the lagoon. Most of the islands you see in this picture are not, in fact, natural. They were created when the Dresden Intercoastal Waterway, we call them spoil islands, and they're mostly made up of things like Brazilian pepper and Australian pine, things that shouldn't be here. They're not really functioning wetlands. We have hardened shorelines instead of uh, fringing wet, uh, wetlands. Uh, we have things like seawalls. Some of our wetlands are impounded. So here's a picture of what that looks like. We lost a lot of the vegetation and then more on, more on that story later. And then we've converted wetlands that might look like a wetland from the air, but in fact, it's just been converted into a re retention pond that really doesn't have much value. It has some value for, for stormwater storage and so forth, but it do it's not functioning like a wetland should. We also have the issue of exotic and invasive species, Brazilian pepper, melaleuca, hydrilla being some of the, uh, the major players, but uh, we can add to that even cattail, which is a native species, but it can become invasive. It's terrific at taking up phosphorus, and so we use it in treatment wetlands for that reason, including within the Everglades STAs. Uh, coastal plain willow, a woody species that can move into a, into a wetland if the hydro period is not right, or if the prescribed burning uh, um, regime isn't right. So it's a, it's a good indicator that something's wrong with our wetland because it can completely take over. And of course, there's some animals, right? I'm sure you've heard about Burmese python story. Um, eating mammals as they go and working their way north in Florida. Uh, you know, but the good news here is the, the state through FWC has prioritized their wetlands, at least the ones that are public, publicly owned. And so they've got, you know, tremendous um, guides like this one that came out in 2017 that show us our, our wetlands. And then they go through a prioritization process to decide which ones they should be spending their time and money on. <clears throat> So just a couple of quick graphics. So there we have 98,000 miles of rivers and stream, and there's a public-private breakdown for those. There's non-forested, five, about five and a half million acres. Forested, 4.2 million acres. Total lakes, 32,000 lakes. Isn't that tremendous? And most of those are private. And then here's our estuarine habitats, and of course, Florida well known for its springs, over a thousand springs in Florida. So all of these relate strongly to uh, the importance of wetlands in our state. Uh, the trends have gotten better though, I mean, it's a bit disturbing to look. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we had this policy of no net loss of wetlands, which meant if you destroy a wetland, it doesn't necessarily mean you had to, you create a new wetland, it could just mean you help the function of an existing wetland. 
So by mapping, we can look from the mid-50s to the mid-70s in Florida, we lost 72,000 acres of wetlands. From the mid-70s to mid-80s, 23,700. And then from 85 to 96, 5,000. So the good news is the number's been going down, right? Um, and part of this has been centered around this five-acre debate. Uh, the federal government is sort of going back and forth on this issue. Is a wetland that's five acres or less really that important? I would say yes. Um, but uh, that's where the threshold is often, often comes in, where the federal government has decided basically to write those off in a sense. Uh, so yeah, the good news is we're getting better. And we're getting better at doing restoration and conservation. And that's mostly what we want to talk about tonight. A couple of resources you might want to consider um, if you want to learn more about wetlands, if I don't tell you enough tonight. Um, and that is, you can look for the FNA website to look at their wetlands map. If we zoom in to where we are tonight, you can see that there are some very high priority wetlands just within uh, you know, a stone's throw of where we are. Another one is the National Wetlands Inventory. This one's especially useful for me and my job because uh, here's an example. We're going to zoom in very close right across the lagoon from us right now. You can click on one wetland and it gives you details about it. So this one is a freshwater emergent wetland that's 200 and 85 acres, uh, so very, very useful tools online. Uh, here's another example of a useful tool, the Nature Conservancy in Northeast Florida. They map the existing salt marsh, so that's in blue. And then you'll see adjacent to the blue, sort of a, uh, a yellowish brownish color, and that's where they project that salt marsh will move to as a result of sea level rise, unless we develop those places. So very important tools that we can use to look at the long-term prospects for wetlands. DU has a tremendous uh, legacy in Florida. I've only been working for DU for two years. I was on the first regional biologist, but that's not to say DU hasn't spent a lot of time here, because they have. And <clears throat> all of this relates strongly to a Southeast Wetlands Initiative. At this point, about 720,000 acres that we've, we've conserved within this stretch of, of what we call the Atlantic Flyway. Very important for birds. So here are just some of those projects, probably the most famous of which is going to be the Goodwin-Broadmoor WMA. Uh, so this is in southern Brevard County, where we took farmland and we created impounded freshwater wetlands specifically for waterfowl. So these areas are hunted. A few days of the, of the year, you're able to hunt them, uh, and they've just been uh, you know, tremendous for bringing waterfowl to the state and also giving some recreational opportunities to hunters. And as I mentioned, a lot of what we do in DU is uh, federally grant funded. And the main grant that we use is, is referred to as NACA. It's North American Wetland Conservation Act. So here are just some examples of projects that we're working on. But I want to focus your attention uh, uh, in the middle of the state there, a place called DeLuca Preserve. When you write these grants, you have to have match. If you ask for a million dollars, you need to have $2 million of your own money in match. That's uh, how you score the most points on these grants. And we had a tremendous uh, opportunity in that uh, the DeLuca Preserve was donated to us, uh, to the University of Florida specifically, with Ducks Unlimited holding the conservation easement. It's a beautiful property, about 27,000 acres in the Kissimmee Basin. And <clears throat> it's been very well maintained with fire and so forth. Um, there's a, um, about 1,500 head of cattle on it. Uh, so it's, you know, it's used as a working ranch as well. The land value uh, was probably somewhere north of $90 million. But what we were able to do is bankroll $25 million of the land value, and we can use that as our match for doing projects around the state. Like I said, it's an absolutely beautiful property. There's some of those pitcher plants I uh, mentioned earlier that are uh, on that property, and also some rare species like the Florida grasshopper sparrow. So as I mentioned, we're able to use uh, money from sources like that as our match for our federal NACA grant. And so I just want to give you some examples of some of the work we've been doing around the state. So once again, here we are on the, the upper Kissimmee, uh, uh, Gardner Cobb Marsh, uh, run by the Water Management District. And we're able to go back in and fill in some of those ditches. Remember we talked earlier about how Florida is very much ditched and drained. So if we fill in those ditches, 
then we can restore that historic hydro period and have water sheet flow across the landscape like it did historically. And so here's an example of how we did that, uh, with about 6,300 acres benefiting. Our next step at that lake, uh, if you look at uh, a picture on the left there, you'll see a berm, it's about 20 feet high. And so that's the uh, yellow line that you'll see on the map on the right. Uh, so they created a berm such that the lake would not flood into its historic floodplain. And we're gonna be taking that berm out so that it can flood as it, as it naturally should. We also do land acquisition. Uh, in this case uh, here, we help the US Fish and Wildlife Service with uh, a purchase of just one of many parcels at Triple Diamond Ranch. Uh, now we're gonna move to the, the far southwest reaches of Florida, the uh, southern end of the Everglades to a place called Cape Sable. And, and even this um, has been touched by man in, the term, in terms of, of ditching and draining. So we're gonna zoom in here on one of many canals that were dug back in the 1930s where they were using this area for farming. Rollerson Canal is the last canal to be plugged. They've already plugged all the others with these earthen water control structures. So we're gonna be, we're gonna be plugging Rollerson Canal as the last one. And as a result, it will back up water into the Everglades where it belongs for in a, an area of 50,000 acres. So it's one of the largest projects we've ever worked on. And part of that story, um, <clears throat> with respect to wading birds. Wading birds, of course, depending on which bird, need a specific water depth in order to forage. Little blue heron, maybe 10 to 15 centimeters, a wood stork, something higher than that. So it's important for us to be able to, to define our performance success with looking at um, species like this. So you can see that the foraging area would be that ideal water depth for certain species. And so there's a modeling effort that can be used to do this. As a result of this, you can, um, you can map out what are the areas over time, time and space, uh, in which the birds can, can forage. This, of course, relates to sea level rise. A lot of these same models are being used for sea level rise. And what's happening there as a result of the canals is we're getting what's referred to as peat loss. Remember our soil profile picture that wetlands lay down a peat layer over time. Well, here's an example of where you're losing that peat uh, on the marsh surface. So we're, we're losing wetland footprint as a result of those canals. And so being able to plug them is going to uh, do a tremendous amount to help. You know, one of the things we struggle with in doing restoration is asking the question, how far back in time do you want to go for restoration? Um, you know, we have some of the best records of mosquitoes uh, with, on, within the east coast of Florida, especially Brevard County. And back in the uh, mid-1800s, it was more than 200 bites a minute. I remember telling my parents, I'm working in Mosquito Lagoon, and they said, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> I said, no, no, it's really a beautiful place. Um, but because of all the tremendous work regarding mosquito control, that's why you and I can live here. And for the longest time, the way that, that mosquito control folks would test an area is to expose a certain amount of skin and count the number of <laughs> mosquitoes that land on them. Now, over time, we realized they're attracted to carbon dioxide, right? It's coming out of our mouths or any, any mammal that's breathing, right? And birds and mammals that are breathing course, producing carbon dioxide. So now they use carbon dioxide traps to, uh, to assess some of the mosquito populations that way. But there are maybe other terms we should be using. Sometimes we use the term restoration, in which we really are turning something back into the way it used to be, right, as much best we can. We also use terms like enhancement. Sometimes we're just making something a little bit better. Uh, and of course, rehabilitation. We're setting something on a course toward uh, being in a better place. Uh, so we're always having this debate in the restoration world. Um, how far back in history are we going <laughs> when we're trying to set our targets? <clears throat> and when it comes to Indian River Lagoon marshes, uh, this is what the, the natural profile used to be. And because we know that mosquitoes will oviposit, that is, lay their eggs on freshly washed mud, once they figured that out in the mid-1900s, they realized, well, all we have to do is change the marshes and do away with mosquitoes. So they impounded the marshes by doing this, by digging and setting up a dike around the marsh. 
Here's what that looks like. So in the hydrologic restoration world, one of the things we could do is to put in connections because obviously fish need to move into these areas, fish, crabs, shrimp. The marsh is the nursery ground. So once we realized that, we started doing restoration like this. Or we can completely push the dike back into the ditch in those areas that aren't prolific mosquito breeders. So that's how we've done restoration in a lot of these areas. So the impounded marsh, we were able to control the water level and therefore control the amount of mosquitoes that were breeding. And so that's, that's the typical situation here. It's referred to as RIM now, uh, Rotational Impoundment Management, where it's closed during the summer, peak mosquito breeding, and open the rest of the year so that we have all those transient fishes, snook, et cetera, tarpon, uh, able to get into the marsh. And there's lots of ways that we can uh, study the effects of this, right? The performance measures. We can look at what's coming in and, the, in and out of the culvert. I mean, 1,500 juvenile snook were caught in one culvert trap set in three hours. It was at night. It was a rough night. <laughs> <clears throat> As I mentioned, we can also just completely take out the dikes. So here's an example of that happening up at Merritt Island. Also at Merritt Island, uh, you have impoundments that are very famous for duck hunting because they're able to manipulate the water level and, and make just the right habitat to attract waterfowl. So here's the Peacock's Pocket impoundment. The dike was damaged by Hurricane Irma, uh, so we were able to come in and redo some of that. In the process, we straightened out some of the, the hairpin turns that are prone to breaching and, and make a new road, you see on the right, a new dike. And on the left, we took the old dike and scraped it down, so we're making more wetland habitat. As we can see, there are already some native species moving in, like cord grass. Other places, I mean, here's an example of the intercoastal waterway up at North Peninsula State Park in Northeast Florida. So that long straightaway um, where the boats will go, the intercoastal waterway, that of course is not natural. And when they dredge that, they pile the spoil up onto the adjacent wetland. So here we're going about the process of taking that down to marsh elevation, and then we'll plant it with native species and recreate the marsh. You know, marshes are incredibly resilient, uh, but they can only take so much. So here's the, the Jensen Beach impoundment uh, just north of us. And when Hurricane Irma came through, uh, we basically flooded the mangroves. It was a drowning of mangroves. So there, we're debating what to do next with this situation. On uh, places like South Carolina, instead of culverts, they use uh, what are referred to as rice trunks. And this has been used for hundreds of years and they will grow rice uh, within the wetland. Uh, here's Hickory Mound up in Big Bend. Do you uh, worked on this project many years ago? It's kind of a scary dike to drive on. <laughs> uh, I did it in a rainstorm once. I don't. I don't advise that. Um, <clears throat> but this one is specifically manipulated to grow widgeon grass, freshwater associate grass, and uh, this is a, a banner crop year, one of the best years ever. So they'll drain it down so the uh, seeds of the widgeon grass. Uh, are you know, ready to go, and then they'll raise, slowly raise the water back up as the plant grows. We can also do this with spoil islands, as we mentioned earlier. Spoil islands really just have a lot of exotic species on it, maybe with a fringe of mangroves. Here's an example of where DOT paid for mitigation because they had wetland impacts elsewhere. This is up in Fort Pierce. They took 90,000 cubic yards off the island and created a mangrove swamp and seagrass lagoon. And we can do things like track the seagrass as it moves in. And we can catch all the critters in there and see if it looks like a seagrass bed within the IRL. A little further north, uh, so we're gonna be in the Mosquito Lagoon area now. We're gonna look at uh, sort of a natural wetland situation here. So we have what we call the marsh residents, especially fiddler crabs and some of these small fishes that can handle the harsh conditions of the marsh. Then we have the transients, the fishery species we like, redfish, snook, et cetera, that come in mostly to eat the residents. So as the water comes up, they're gonna, they're gonna do that. They're gonna come onto the marsh surface and feed. So the net production, in other words, the biomass is being converted from the residents, which are prolific breeders, into the residents, uh, or rather into the transients um, as they move out into open water. Of course, mosquito pr production being a big part of this, as I mentioned, they lay their eggs on freshly washed mud. When the water tide comes up or there's a rain event, 
They hatch, go through several instars. Some of them will be eaten within the marsh. That's really the goal, <laughs> for them predominantly to be eaten within the marsh by fishes and birds and so forth. But some of them, of course, are going to fledge. So the way they handled mosquitoes there was to do what's referred to as dragline ditching. So there's a picture of a dragline ditch. So they changed the marsh into this, artificial upland with deep open water. You ask yourself, well, where are the wetlands? Well, they're just on the fringes. There's hardly anything left of them. But we can restore these to a degree. So we make a new contour that's not quite the way it used to be, but pretty close. It still gives us mosquito control, but it gives us a more productive marsh system, more productive nursery habitat. So here's what dragline ditch looks like from the air. You can see the deep water areas and then the high ground. We use a pretty unique uh, instrument for this, a machine that uh, was made in Louisiana for coastal marsh work there. It can actually float. Uh, and we pull down the spoil piles and create the maximum footprint of wetland that we can. So that's what it looks like immediately after. And here's what it looks like after eight years. Well, what's that look like on the ground? Well, here's a, a good example. If you keep your eyes on the tree in the background, I promise this next shot is the same place. So it can be a really dramatic change. And one of the great tools that we can use, of course, is um, looking from the air at these areas. And we can calculate how much wetland footprint we gained in the process. So 21 acres restored at that site. And of course, we can look at all the plants associated, um, their proximity to open water, and um, how many years ago we did the restoration. So lots of, lots of science and restoration um, happening behind this. So here's all the dragline ditch we've done in Volusia County, Mosquito Lagoon. So as an example, here's a Bottle Island site. This is before we restored it. You can see the spoil piles. Here's immediately after. Uh, two years later, and six years later, and nine years later. As you can imagine, we, there is some criticism to it. When you look uh, on the left, that's uh, before we restore. On the right, immediately after, it doesn't look so great. And so in trying to answer some of the questions about the criticism that we get about this work, we decided to design a study where we could really understand the performance measures so here's a fisheye view of a spoil pile before res restoration, and here's one a couple years after. Very different habitat, right? What does this mean to the fishes? Well, we decided to design a study where we'd use a special kind of net called a fike net. We set it at high tide, and we let it fish as the tide goes out. So here's what that looks like in place. And we used different treatments. We did sites that were not restored, non-restored. We did ones that were immediately restored that year. And then we, we did ones that were restored uh, nine years prior. So we could look at old restored, if you will. And it's a very telling data set. And that is that <clears throat> when you look at Necton, so that's shrimps, crabs, and fishes, the newly restored were similar to the non-restored and the old restored. Uh, in terms of mean abundance, that is the number of, of critters. But in terms of mass, they're all the same. We can look at things like fish abundance, blue crab abundance, panea shrimps. Panea shrimps is one of, that's of greatest interest to us because we know from the literature that marsh footprint that is in area is a great predictor of shrimp production. As we can see, see the gray bars there, it's the older sites that are the best at producing blue crabs and shrimps. We look at sport fish, again, gray bar, the older sites are the best ones. And those are things like spotted sea trout, but the star of the show being snook. So these areas are very important for, gold, for, uh, for common snook. So what we discover in this is that immediately after you, you restore, one of the predominant things you get is called the clown goby. Not too big of a surprise, they like mud. And there's lots of mud in a newly restored area. But over time, the, looking at the old restored, the gray bar, it's common snook that is the greatest indicator. So we know that our restoration is doing the right thing. We're creating juvenile snook habitat. Here's another project. This is up at the, in the Panhandle, the Apalachicola River, referred to as MK Ranch. 
very interesting place that uh, we're trying to restore sheet flow. So this is a river. So this is a floodplain marsh area. A river should be able to overflow its bank, banks and flow into its floodplain. But in this case, um, 55 miles of dishes were put in to make a rice farm in the 1970s. And so our goal is to restore that sheet flow across the landscape. One of the great tools to be able to, to help us plan that is uh, LIDAR. So it's laser imaging from, from an aircraft that shows us the elevation in great detail. And from this, we also put water level uh, gauges in the landscape. From this, we come up with a hydrologic model. So this being such a large place, almost 7,000 acres, we didn't want to do any guesswork. We really wanted to model this. And so there's sophisticated models available to do this. But the upshot is, from there, we determined areas where we need to fill in ditch. But we don't have to fill in all 55 miles. We couldn't afford that, right? This is a $21 million project, and we're going to selectively fill certain ditches in order to restore that landscape. And it's always important to look back in history. Uh, in some places in Florida, you can go back to the 19, uh, late 1930s with aerial photography. In this area, back to 1953, so we can really look at what the place used to look like, and this uh, helps us set our targets for the future. So as I mentioned, we're looking at water level, we're looking at turbidity, right? the amount of sediment in the water is part of our performance measure. But how else could we define success? Well, we're gonna have certain number of feet of ditch filled, that's a pretty easy one. Uh, but what else? I mean, what about the ecology? Uh, and that uh, brings us to a sort of a new technology, and that is the use of drones. And there are pretty unique cameras that can uh, see, so to speak, um, wavelengths that we don't see with the, with the human eye. So here's an example of a five band camera. And I'm gonna show you a series of five pictures uh, with the five bands. And these are, these are false, they're called false color because we actually couldn't see these with the natural eye. So here's the first shot, band one, here's band two, band three, four, and five. So what you've seen there, what you would have seen through that series is that you get certain reflectance off certain things depending on the band. Some things are more obvious than others. And with that, we're able to stitch these together. We have numerous photographs over, let's say, a 20-acre area. We stitch them all together. We do uh, ground control points where we know the elevation. That's the bucket lid painted there. Poor man's surveying tool. We flag certain things. So here we flag willow that I mentioned before, a woody species. So we want to be able to tell what that looks like uh, in our model later. And we can produce things like digital surface elevation models. So the red is the taller trees. The, uh, the blue being the lowest open water areas. And we could spend a whole talk on this. In fact, I have. <laughs> um, where you're taking the stacking of all of those bands of digital images, putting them together, if you will, in a giant pie, and uh, putting them into geographic information systems using machine learning, so we teach the software what a willow looks like or what a spatter dock, a floating plant looks like. Because what we're trying to do is get separation. So here's a bunch of different models. And the one that appears to be giving us the best separation, if you can see it there, this third one from the right is NDVI, Normalized uh, Difference Vegetation Index. So that's giving us the best separation because what we want to be able to do is before and after restoration, assess the changes that we made to the plants to the landscape. So here's an example of uh, some of those things. We have bare, bare road, yellow, that's the road that's created on the dike. We have open water in blue. We have marshy habitat in light blue. And we have floating vegetation in red. And we'll use something called a pixel-based approach. Pretty good separation, we can, we can tell what these things are. If we use an object-based approach, however, you notice you'll see the yellow of the road and lots of yellow of the floating vegetation. This model can't separate a bare road from floating vegetation. So it wouldn't be a model that we want to use. I'm sure you all heard about the Kissimmee Restoration, um, the headwaters of the, of the Everglades. So what you see in this shot is on the left-hand side is the old canal that they've now filled in and created the me meandering river like it, like it should be. So we have a small version of that in our own neighborhood. Here's the North Fork St. Lucie River. It was also channelized and straightened back in the, the early 1900s. 
And in this case, we're putting breaches into the landscape. This is the artificially high riverbank that shouldn't, shouldn't be there. So we can put in culverts or create tide creeks to rehydrate, get water back into those areas. And once again, we can use these tools of uh, net dragging to look at all the, uh, the benefits to the various species. We had no snook uh, within the marsh before reconnecting and snook afterwards. So we, we know we did a good job there. And once again, we can use that uh, laser imagery, LIDAR. This is further upstream in the North Fork. And uh, this is uh, dirty work, right? Um, you can lose machines into the muck there if you're not careful. And so here's an example of before and after where we've reconnected a river oxbow, a river bend that was there historically. And here's what that looks like. So I think it's important that we at least uh, pay a little bit of uh, respect to the Everglades restoration. It is, in fact, the largest restoration project ever attempted on Earth, and it's a wetland restoration project. There's uh, another one that's, uh, that's also equally as large, roughly you know, 8,000 square miles, and that is um, the Mesopotamian marshes of southern Iraq. Those are drained as when Saddam Hussein was trying to chase out rebels from, from his country. And so those have lost basically 75% of their cover. So that's equally as large in terms of scope. Um, so here's just a you know, basic graphic of uh, the pre-drainage flow, the current flow, and what we're trying to do to restore it. And I, and I liken it to, um, to what happens when you break a mirror. If you break a mirror and try to put it back together, it's going to have some reflection of what it used to be, but it's not going to be exactly the way it used to be. And that's where we're headed. And it's all about the quality, quantity, distribution, and timing of water, because that's what wetlands depend on. Lots of performance measures associated with this. How do we decide what, uh, what is success when it comes to Everglades restoration? Well, there's things like tree islands, listed species like Rosie's Moonville, the seagrasses of Florida Bay, oysters in certain places. Of course, all these species we very much care about, spotted sea trout, common snook, and shrimps. So lots of that happening. What does the neighborhood version of that look like for us? Well, here we are looking at the St. Lucie River. So these massive, Stormwater treatment areas and reservoirs are going to be going in. You, you may have heard that term, stormwater treatment area, or STA. That's a wetland. It's a created wetland in which they're going to you know, be filtering the water because that's what, what wetlands can do. And there's a tremendous amount of research with Water Management District on the ability of these wetlands to take up nutrients, especially phosphorus, which is the main thing we're dealing with when it comes to pollution of the Everglades. And this, this issue of treatment wetlands has been used for, for many, many years. We, we understand in a lot of ways what they can handle and what they can do for us. Here's just some examples from around the state. Over in Pasco County, we, we visited a site where they're pumping 5 million gallons of treated wastewater into 200 acres of created wetlands to treat the, treat the water. Here's Spoonbill Marsh in Indian River County, uh, just up the road from us. This is a reverse osmosis water. So it's highly saline that comes out of that plant. They blend it with... Uh, other water and basically created a salt marsh out of it. And here's an example on private land. This is Bull Hammock in Martin County. So you can see that's a, that's a ranch, but there's a large wetland created uh, directly adjacent to the canal. So they pull water out of the canal and use it uh, to treat that water and then put it back in the canal. And he's being paid for this, right? So you see the uh, PES term is pay for environmental services. There's lots of examples of this, especially uh, within the Kissimmee Basin as well, where they're really trying to meet water quality targets by storing land, including on, on private property. Uh, as I mentioned, roughly 50% of the wetlands in Florida are privately owned, and so we work very closely with private landowners, ranchers and farmers and so forth. And a lot of that is uh, through the Farm Bill federal program that's run by USDA in their NRCS program. Um, so here you, you can see an example where We've suggested to a farmer that if he disc around his wetland uh, prior to the ducks coming, uh, that it'll produce just the right suite of plants that are seed producers and it'll attract uh, the ducks that he's looking for. Another consideration here is that, that our marshes are in fact drowning. You know, with sea level rise and with subsidence, we're losing marsh footprint for that reason. And so there's a lot of talk about using the beneficial um, beneficial dredge use. So when, when we dredge the intercoastal waterway, for example, we can place this on top of a marsh uh, to increase the, the elevation. 
Here's an example of that at Merritt Island where we're testing different things. Uh, we tried different types of sediment or a mix of them. Uh, and it's also important that uh, in some cases, because it's eroding, as you can see, this, this is an erosion and happening in Texas on salt marsh, we have to put breakwaters in front. And in some of those situations, we're able to put sand behind that breakwater to recreate marsh footprint. So I want to, uh, we're going to wrap it up here quickly. Uh, I want to leave you with a couple thoughts. And there's, there is some hope on the horizon, right? Uh, you may have heard of the study that came out a couple years ago about 3 billion birds have been lost in North America since the 1970s. The exception to that is that we've gained water-related birds. So the wading birds and waterfowl. So there is some good news. Because of all the conservation work that's happened uh, within North America by DU and so many other partners, um, that's a success story. And here's just some examples of how waterfowl rely on wetlands. There's a canvas back eating a clam. And there's a ringneck duck there on the bottom center that's eating the tuber of uh, one of our lilies. So wrapping up, there's a really interesting report that was done by 1,000 Friends of Florida that I encourage you to check out if, if you like. It's online. As we look to the future and our water needs, sometimes we think Florida has plenty of water, but it's really, really not the case. And so here's our baseline that was done in 2010 of the water usage. So the, the darker the color there, the, the, the greater the use. And as you can see, south of the lake, for example, they, they need a lot of water to keep those wetlands going. Places like you know, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, obviously, a lot, of, a lot of drinking water needs and so forth. So moving on, this is what it could look like in 2070. Lots of development, red on the, the right there, map on the right is, being, is developed land. Be a lot, if we, can, if we continue with current trends or current zoning, that's what we would look like. But in the report, what they do is talk about, here's the 2070 alternative. We can strike a balance here. We can learn the lessons of the past to protect our natural areas. You might have heard of the Florida Wildlife Corridor, if you're not, I encourage you to look into that, but it's about trying to acquire some of these properties, most of which are wet, um, so that we can uh, continue to preserve Florida. Uh, here's a couple other resources for you. Uh, our members get uh, Ducks Unlimited magazine, uh, but we also produce through our Wetlands America Trust, um, the Wetlands America magazine. So both of these are available online if you'd like more information. So at that point, I want to say thanks very much for your time. Um, I'll also add, there's now a DU tag in Florida, as if Florida needed more tags. Uh, so there's <laughs> one more to choose from of the 90 or so out there. Um, so that's, that's now available. And I will start the question answer period at this point, but I'd like to start it with my own question, if that's okay to the crowd. So based on what you've learned tonight about the importance of wetlands and so forth, when you see this in a neighborhood, a retention pond, is there anything you could do to make that better? To make it better, a better functioning wetland? An alligator? <laughs> right, we could, we could plant it, right? You know, the disturbing scene for most retention ponds in Florida is they probably used to be wetlands, right? They pick the lowest spot, they dig it out and make a lake. You've got grass to the edge, grass clippings might be going in. So that's one thing we could do. We could do not push grass clippings into these places, uh, which just feeds and leaves in the trees, right? Um, chances are good there's probably some herbiciding, pesticide spraying happening along the bank here. Another thing that uh, we could do without. But remember, it's that littoral zone, that's sort of the business end, that shallow area next to the shore that's the most important part of the wetland. And what we could easily do is create littoral zones in some of these places. You see it happening naturally sometimes. They'll build a wetland, it'll erode, or they'll build a retention pond, it will erode on the edge, and something will start to form, and unfortunately, they might come along and, and spray it. But that's really the worst thing you could do. So I think there's a lot of lessons for Florida and other states as well, of how we could better manage our, our retention ponds. Thanks. And Jeff, just a reminder to repeat all of our questions for our Zoom audience. Thanks, I appreciate it. Yes, sir.
what's what water company specifically are you thinking about here? Okay, gotcha. Yeah, mostly those are drawing out of Florida Springs. So the, the, the question real quick was, do the companies that take water out of, out of springs and out of the ground for, for drinking water, do they have an impact on wetlands? Right, thank you. Um, so they're predominantly taking water out of springs. Springs, of course, are important toward the floodplain of the river in which, you know, that's receiving that spring water. Um, so potentially so, yeah. And I think a lot of those companies, um, you know, they, they will work on wetland restoration projects within the state of Florida, for example. Right, okay. Um, I don't know much about them, but uh, the question was about the duck stamps. Uh, so many decades ago, the duck stamp was created, I think in the 1930s, right around the time that the DU got started. Um, and so it's a way for us to raise revenue to help waterfowl populations. Um, and so for anyone that, that hunts waterfowl in the U.S., you must purchase not only a hunting license for your given state, but you also have to purchase a federal duck stamp. And it's really not that expensive. Uh, but money for that goes to some of the grants that I mentioned earlier um, so that we can do more wetland conservation. So it's been a you know, really good thing for many decades. All right, we've got a, a couple of great questions coming in from our Zoom audience. We'll start with an invasive species question. With Florida having so many invasive species and with many invasive species favoring fresh ground or wetland, how does that affect restoration efforts in the state? Right. Uh, so for most of the state, exotic species play a big role in our wetlands uh, or, or uplands for that matter. It's really only in extreme north, north Florida that it's not that much of a concern. There's a few things up there like Chinese tallow and whatnot. But for the bulk of the state, it's always a concern. And when you get into wet areas, you get things like torpedo grass, para grass, you know, many others. Um, so it's a matter of hydro period. As, you know, as we mentioned before, what defines a wetland is the amount of water and the, the period of time that that water is there. So for some of these, these species, we can control water level and deal with the exotics. Um, that's especially true of woody species. Most woody species don't like a lot of water, so if you keep a wetland very wet, uh, in general, you're gonna keep the woody species out. Um, but then there's also, also the mechanical. You, know, you can go in with uh, all sorts of mechanical operations, machines uh, that can take out exotics, and of course, um, you know, herbicides at times. All right, I'll, I'll jump in with another Zoom question. Uh, can you discuss the role of wetland mitigation banks as it relates to restoration? Yeah, I don't know much about those, but I, I'll tell you how it, how it generally works. So as I mentioned, you know, in, in our nation, we, once we finally realize that wetlands are valuable and have importance, as we discussed tonight, uh, we realize that uh, when you damage wetlands, say to build a development, for example, you need to mitigate that somehow. Um, and so one of those cases was to set up a large area of wetland referred to as a mitigation bank. So it's a restoration, ongoing restoration that's happening on a given property. And people can pay into the bank in order to damage wetlands elsewhere. And usually that works on a statewide basis. So if you're going to damage wetlands in the state of Florida, you can pay into one of Florida's mitigation banks um, as, as credit toward that. Yes, sir. Can you tell me why the uh, Stewart City Commission's already banned freezers to destroy wetlands right near the river so we can have four more, 400 farm and rental tenements on a Costco? So the question is can I tell you why <laughs> <laughs> the Stewart Commission, was it the city or the county? City. City. The city of Stewart Commission decided to destroy some wetlands. To allow for an apartment building? 400 tenements and a Costco. Plus. Apartment building plus a Costco. Yeah.
right. Sure, sure. So the follow-up question there is, based on zoning, how do we let that happen? I don't know what this, this particular property is zoned. In fact, I don't know really anything about this particular project, but I mean, all I can tell you is that there are permits on the books, state, federal, sometimes county, that allow for wetlands to be destroyed. Now, they're supposed to be mitigated for, and as I mentioned, that's a, you know, a complicated issue, mitigation. Sometimes it's one for one. If you destroy one acre, you have to create or conserve one acre. Sometimes it's a matter of if you destroy one acre, you simply maybe take out Brazilian pepper and some other exotics that shouldn't be in a given wetland, and that is seen as compensatory, right? So sometimes that happens. So again, sorry, I don't know the specific case about Stuart, um, but you know, I will tell you this. Um, you know, I've lived in this state since the mid-'80s, and of course worked in the, in the wetland community for, for all that time. And there was, a, there was a time in Florida where there was a really a strong push from the, the state level, from the Tallahassee level, to try to control things like wetland loss or growth in general. And it was successful to some degree. But what I've seen as the most successful is when people get involved at the local level, at the city commission level, at the county commission level, that, I think, is where your voice is, our voices are mostly heard, you know, for issues like this. And, and that's a perfect tie-in to a question from one of our Zoom viewers. What is the single best thing a private citizen can do to help preserve our wetlands? Hmm. Well, I'll go back to what I just said before. <laughs> you know, being actively involved uh, with your city um, and counties in terms of the planning and decisions that are being made, I think that's a, that's a very big one. Uh, but, but secondly would be, uh, we must admit that we're all part of the problem, right? And so as you look at your own um, yard, for example, or business, um, what is it that you could do to improve the situation? I, for example, in my yard, I live up in, in Vero. Um, I don't use pesticides, I don't use herbicides. Do I fight with fire ants some days? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I, that's just a choice that I've decided to make. You know? So there are, there are things that we can do. Uh, individually, when it comes to things like retention ponds, as we talked about, perhaps you know something that a, a community could could help with, right? We serve the city. <laughs> There's always that route. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm having a little trouble hearing. I heard Army Corps of Engineers in the state of Florida. Oh, right, the 404. So that's, um, that's mostly a water quality thing. And what happened, the question there is um, specifically the 404, which is one of the federal rules regarding wetlands and the water quality associated. And what happened was the state of Florida agreed to assume that responsibility that uh, previously had been that of the Army Corps. So now when I apply for permits to do restoration projects, I of course have to get permits as well. Now the water quality aspects of those permits are handled by the state instead of the Army Corps. They're still using the same rules, mind you. They still have to meet the thresholds in the federal mandate, but it's in fact DEP that now administers that program. Does it make it easier and faster to get permits? No. <laughs> nothing, nothing seems to. Although, I must say, excuse me. <clears throat> within the last 15 years or so, both at the state and federal level, they've created restoration permits, which have been fantastic and do help us to get permits more quickly because they realized we're doing good things out there. And so they, they made it uh, less egregious. <laughs> to get uh, some of these permits that are restoration, if you, if you can meet the, all of the criteria. Yes. So has it turned around to get permits where it was easier to get a permit to destroy, and now it's getting easier to restore? To restore? Yes, I would say in the last 15 years, the question was, um, has permitting changed such that it's easier to restore? Yes, especially with these specific restoration permits that are now available. Yeah, and honestly, before those, before those permits became available, 
you know, we, we worked very closely with, uh, all, with the permitting folks. These, these are people I've worked with for my whole career. And they love to see restoration projects come across their desk. And so they've all always been as helpful as they can be within the rules. All right, I've, I've got another interesting question from our, our Zoom audience. Uh, artificial levees and canal banks are the last strongholds for the eastern indigo snake, which is a federal and state threatened species, as well as the Florida king snake, which is included in FWC's rare snake surveys and is likely one of the most imperiled reptiles in the state. Restoration is destroying some of the last strong populations of those species in South Florida, where they've already disappeared in most quote unquote natural habitats. So, so the question is, is the elimination of certain imperiled species worth it for the greater good of wetlands? Mm, yeah, good question. I mean, always one we debate. There's always gonna be winners and losers when you develop something or when you try to restore something. There will always be those considerations. As I mentioned, every time we do a restoration project, we have to get state and federal and sometimes county permits as well. And things like imperiled species and their effect, the project effects on those species, that's all part of that story. Now that, those decisions aren't made by us, you know, they're made by the permitters. You know, but I will say, uh, when it comes specifically to the question, which was, when you're demolishing levees or filling ditches, as I mentioned, we go through the hydrologic modeling process so that we don't have to fill every ditch. We, we wouldn't be able to afford it anyway. So we are leaving some berm in place in some of these cases, which does give you that high ground for some of these species. But I think the moral of the story there is we also need to be protecting uplands. Right? The Florida Wildlife Corridor, I think, is a good example of, of protecting both wetlands and uplands. And some of these keystone species that uh, this person's mentioned uh, will fall within that corridor. We have, we have time for maybe one or two more questions from here at the library. I see some hands up. Certainly it could, if you could have it as a planted littoral zone, absolutely. If you're willing to keep some vegetation there, right, which is taking up nutrients and providing habitats for everything, then yeah, that's a win-win. Right, right. Right, well, we touched on riparian buffer in the sense that we looked at hardened shorelines. Um, Palm Beach County, for example, 80% hardened shoreline, right? So there's not much in the way of fringing wetland left. So this concept of living shorelines is very important. In some cases, you can actually put things right in front of the seawall. They did this on one of the golf courses in Palm Beach, by the way. They put a breakwater of coquina rock, put in sediment, and planted it with mangroves, and it was very successful. Um, in some cases, you know, where people are losing seawalls, Replacing them with a living shoreline, you know, can be very important. Now, one thing we learned from, from the hurricanes is it's the living shorelines, mangroves especially, that really do well in storms. They dissipate that wave energy. All seawalls are going to fail eventually, right, just given time and energy. True, there are, there are buffer zones. Yes, exactly right. Yeah, there, there's laws in the books about how close you can get to a wetland. Right, that's true. Any other questions here at the Blake? All right, let's give uh, Jeff a big round of applause. Guys, thank you again for coming tonight. Please fill the house next week. Edie Witter is just an incredible hero for the environment here in our area. And uh, I hope you will, you will bring some friends, bring some neighbors. For those of you still with us on Zoom, I hope you'll invite some friends as well. Our final lecture of the series is gonna be a really great presentation. Good night, everybody.